Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this panel. My name is Hans, I'm Murdoch, I run Rampage, and I'll be the moderator for uh, this session. I have three guests here. I'll, uh, I'll let them introduce themselves. On my left. I'm Wilf, I run Metropolis, and then I run several festivals, Hideout, Lost and Found, Part Life, and different things like that around Europe, and then Origin, which is a bass music festival in Australia. That's it. That's it. There is some more, but who cares? I make music as well and some other stuff. Okay, okay, okay. We'll come to that. So, and uh, here to my right is Christian. Christian? Uh, my name is Christian Lakadosh. Um, I'm running youth music management, uh, taking care of talents like K. McCrook, Moro Bikotu, and uh, uh, some, some, some more. Uh, I founded um, several electronic music festivals, uh, Urban Art Forms in Austria, New Forms Festival and uh, started as a festival promoter 15 years ago, and that's it. And over there is Chris from Hospital. Hello, I'm Chris. Uh, I'm co-founder and owner of Hospital Records. Uh, we are a multifaceted music company, but we're also an event promoter. We've been doing our hospitality uh, show since 2001. And uh, I think last year we probably hosted around 75 events worldwide, which includes DJ tours of North America and Australia, UK uh, residencies, shows in mainland Europe, uh, and many other things beside. Okay, Chris, you win. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'll go. So we're here to talk about um, label events versus non-label events. Um, Chris, obviously, will uh, speak on behalf of the label event, because yeah, okay. he's, he's, he's done a few. <laughs> um, Wilf, you do non-label events, but I can imagine that you dabble in label events as well. Yeah, I've done it all, yeah. Yeah, and so which ones have you worked with? Hospital, RAM, Players, um, and also there is non-bass music labels that I've worked with as well. Um, yeah, generally most of them. Okay, so around. Um, you can kind of discuss pros and cons. Christian, right here, you Is do... A neutral position? Yeah, so you, no, you pretty much do strictly non-label events, right? Uh, not at all. I did uh, hospitalities at festivals, uh, normal ones, uh, RAM, uh, Black Butt. Um, it's hard being a promoter and not doing a hospitality event, right? <laughs> well, uh, yes. they seem to be... <laughs> no, but I'm doing... Um, of course, started with non-label events, uh, but over the years, of course, uh, now and then, uh, it makes sense and fun to do. Okay, so let's start with Wilf and Christian. Uh, Wilf, pros and cons of label events and non-label events. Any first thoughts? I, I think it's changed a lot over the years. Um, I suppose... It, in the past, you did some label events because you wanted to get certain artists who were harder to get. I think it's now become more, um, it's become more rigid. Certain artists won't play for other people. Um, more of my shows that I do is independent club shows and obviously in festivals, we have a lot of arenas who want to be branded. So the headline act of that arena wants to brand it with the label they're associated with, um, which has a pro, I also think, there's a failing of it as people buy less music. Um, you then sort of pigeonhole the customer into having to decide, do I or don't I associate with that label? Um, so I'm, I, I, in fairness, I sit on the fence. I see why we do it, and I certainly understand why labels do it as well. Um, they need to also bring through new artists and represent them alongside their biggest talent. Um, but it's also quite, can be quite detrimental to the promoter. And I also think that we lose the experimentation of events where you could just put all different people from different genres of a, of a music scene together in a tent um, and see what happens and what comes from it. And that's probably a disadvantage to the customer more than anyone else, because then usually you find that a lot of the events are formatted and there's more of one style of music throughout the night. So I'm not going to say that that would be boring, but you're limiting down what people are getting to hear and experience. And ultimately, you know, none of us are sat here unless it wasn't for the customer who wants the experience. Um, 
So that's where I sort of sit with some of it. You mentioned earlier that you're not strictly involved with, uh, with bass music events. Yeah. yeah. Um, is it possible that you, that some of the stuff that you were just saying, that it's that is mainly the case outside of bass music? Or do you feel the same about bass music, especially when you mention that like big headliners, they, they insist on branding a certain, certain arena? Do you have that in drum and bass and dubstep as well these days? Uh, you, you have that in drum, in most genres. House music's very prevalent. Yeah. Um, you know, the Paradise brand with Jamie Jones is, is one that, that comes to mind. Um, but in, in a lot of genres, really, you have that where, uh, and, and I get it, the, the, you know, agents, managers, and labels alike want to make sure that the new up and coming guy who's who wouldn't get a look in, gets a look in and, and is exposed so they can keep them to the label and, and they're developed as an act. Um, but it can then always become more same, same and everyone thinks that they've seen something where actually they haven't, you know? And that is probably one of the problems with, with label nights where people go, oh, it's that again. And so the customer feels like, oh, I went to that X amount of time ago. Um, and therefore, that, that can be detrimental. But then I also think, as a promoter, you get the plus side. Someone like Chris might go, that's the budget, and you get all these people for it. And otherwise, if you try to book them yourself as a promoter, you, you, you couldn't afford it. So there, there is advantages to it. There's no, you know, there's no one cap that fits all with this, this question, really. Um, I've sat and thought about it for a few days <laughs> and actually gone, what, what is it that we do anymore? I think, you know, when, when I, I've been promoting 21 years, I know I don't look that old, but, um, you know, I think some of the early brands that I did that with were like Prototype, which was Groove Riders label that was massive. It was really hard back in the day to, to get solid dates with Groove Rider and certain people to play. Um, the Formation and the World of Drum and Bass was one. Things like that, so, um, you know, it, this has always been part of our business. Um, and and it, I, I've promoted hip hop a lot as well, and that was always the case with Def Jam and some of those things. So sometimes you can't get the acts unless you, you use the label, because at least the label have the leverage with the act, you know. So I'm, I'm kind of hearing two things from Wolf, is that on the one hand, he kind of feels that the, the, the nights are becoming a bit more focus on one sound, a little bit more rigid, but yep. on the other hand, it gives you the opportunity to book certain artists or a lot more artists for a budget that you would normally not be able to Yeah, because, I, I mean, for me, what in, in the ideal world, you'd go, we want, the, you know, what we, as a promoter, I would perceive the biggest two acts from Ram, the biggest two acts from Hospital, the biggest act from this label, and you'd have all them, and then the first three or four hours, of the event, you might just have local talent. So, whereas with a label night, the first hour is usually the local DJ and then it's all represented from the label. But then also like, just imagine trying to program the set times. If you had the two biggest artists from Hospital, Ram and Metalheads, n people would refuse to go on at certain times. Like, you, you wouldn't have any one of those two acts. No one would play at 11, no one would play at three. So, one of the things you also get from a label uh, show is, you know, as you described, you know, you maybe, maybe it's a budgetary thing, but also what you're afforded is you're afforded effectively warm up, emerging artist, headliners. Do you know what I mean? Uh, true. Uh, you know how I used to get around that? I used to put two nights on on the same night. Obviously, I, I, in the UK, I operated in the north of England. So, for example, um, DJ Hype once worked 11 times for me in a weekend. <laughs> you know, and that was the way that I did it because yeah. in my mind that was the problem. And, and if I look at old Metropolis parties, we had things like Goldie, Andy, Hype, Noisier play or London Electricity, Hazard, someone, you know, and, and you went, well, can you do this so you can go there? You know, but this was in the hazy days where people were prepared to race down the motorway to another gig. You know, it, but, you, but, but, but you're still actually affording those artists set times within a certain frame because you know that if you ask them to say play at 11, they might say yes if you're going to give them three shows in one night and one of those shows is going to be an outrageously good fee. So there are, there are those aspects that just the practicalities of trying to uh, please the artist and his or her agent. Yeah, completely. That's how come festivals have now gone more and more that way. Yeah. And I think that's... 
it, it, bizarrely, it, it, for, for an artist, it means that the agent can drive the fee up because they'll do less shows because they'll have the prime slot. So there is a benefit to the artist and the label for that to happen. But what we're talking about is, is that beneficial to the promoter? Is the promoter, I suppose, as long as I make money, do I care? But it's detrimental to the customer. And ultimately, that's the, what we're talking about. The more and more the customer feels bored or switches off to something, the less people we have around to support these nights and these fees and the labels and everything that comes with it. And end of the day, at uh, label nights, people or the customer knows exactly what it's getting. And uh, to give you the perspective, as sometimes needed from a promoter outside the UK, <laughs> um, back, especially back in the days when drum and bass, like let's say 10 years ago, when drum and bass had really ups and downs uh, in Austria, uh, and one of the major drum and bass promoters, let's say, fucked up a show and people were kind of um, lost the trust in uh, think it's going to be a good show the next time. Um, if then a label night comes in, people know exactly that will be the quality level of the lineup of the production, because otherwise the label wouldn't do it. And so, um, especially in Austria, label nights have been a kind of also an important instrument to um, bring in or like assure or show to people that will be the quality level at this show yeah. for sure. Yeah. And uh, also, when uh, at times when let's say the, the local scene got weak or on a weaker point again. Uh, to bring in a UK label night uh, always helped kind of to attend more people. On the other hand, um, <clears throat> it might go in two ways. You book a label night and get <clears throat> ripped off, let's say, <laughs> and you could book the whole lineup cheaper yourself, uh, which, is, <laughs> which is probably not... What are you talking about? <laughs> talking the other, uh, if you probably an unexperienced promoter, let's say. <laughs> On the other hand, uh, as, as you mentioned, uh, if it's a good deal and a good, a good and friendly label, thinking uh, to help also the promoters, it's a good package. Uh, you get uh, you get the image, you get the, the lineup, you get probably social media promotion or whatever, and the image transfer to your brand. Um, you, you're running really strong brands, so uh, like let's say business-wise, there might not be a, a need to to get in label nights, but let's say if you build up, especially outside the UK, uh, a new event brand. It also helps to get an image transfer and kind of the approve, uh, approval, your, your brand is good enough that the UK label will work with you. Yeah, I fully agree. It takes a lot of the work out of it. As Chris was saying, you get, you know, someone just goes, there's the package. That's when everyone plays. This is what happens. And also the label and the people who run the label will keep people in line. You know, I'm not going to demand 10 bottles of vodka and dancing girls at three o'clock in the morning. Well, you know, but the, so the, the, there's a make way, and I, I don't, as I said at the start, I don't think there's one perfect answer to this. I think there's a balance. I think I used to really love with Metropolis that we could be multi genre, uh, and we were that for a long time, and then people more and more became refined about being label parties. Um, and then we had a while where we, we did label parties for a lot of people, and then also we booked special guests and people who then represented those label parties. That still happens as well. Um, and more so on the festivals, I suppose, where there's a bigger capacity, where people feel they need to fill it. It's, um, I suppose it's, it's very much as a promoter what size event you are. You know, if, if you're operating, I'd say, between 500 and 1,000 people, I think label parties are, are perfect. You can have that big one headline DJ, you've got something secured. As you get bigger, then the more that that grows and you're trying to sell, obviously it's different for all regions, you become pigeonholed because as, as one label sees that someone, oh, you did this show in Liverpool. Okay, well, the next DJ and their label are like, well, we, we expect to do that. And you might go, well, you're not quite so big in that city. I mean, it, it depends, different promoter. I'm different, I work all over the world. So I suppose for me it's different, so does Chris. So. You, you find different places, different stuff works. I suppose if you're just based in one city, you'll know what works for you. But obviously there's always a pressure from agents and different people to, to make certain stuff happen. I think, I think one of the key issues is that we, we came into this world of events on the basis that we're a record label. We didn't come in thinking, I want to be bigger than Metropolis. We just said we're a record label, our key, interest here is promoting our artists and our music 
So we start, you know, we started a tiny monthly in East London, um, basically because like no one would book us, so you book yourselves. And um, after five years of hard graft and doing that occasionally in Cardiff, just because we had an artist from Cardiff who was called High Contrast, you know, you then get to a point where you think, actually, we're going to go and do Heaven. It's the first time we did a really big show. And we did Heaven because basically all the really big promoters in London would offer us room two. And you get to a point where you're like, I, I'm not doing room two anymore. I'm doing room one. And our perspective continues and is, has always been we prioritise our artists and our music. Uh, that will always be the focus for hospitality. We're, we're fortunate to get to a point where... Uh, we know most people in the drum and bass scene worldwide. Uh, we have a lot of friends, we have a lot of favourite artists from all sorts of different areas who from time to time, if we're lucky, will come and play for us. But nine times out of ten, we're here to promote our artists, and that includes our youngest artists, who might have to be told to go and play at eight o'clock and play to the sound man and no one else. Uh, and that includes, you know, Camo and Crooked and Danny Bird and everyone else. Um, but I'm also aware that we with what we did, particularly when we started to do Heaven, and then alongside Ram started to do Matter, which is now called Building Six, that did have an impact on the drum and bass club scene. Uh, it wasn't intentional, I think for both labels, but particularly for us, you know, the, it was purely focused on bringing our artists through and, prom and promoting that brand. Um, it has had, I think, particularly in the UK, a detrimental effect on some of the maybe longer standing drum and bass club nights that we grew up with, yeah, yeah. you know. Uh, but then again, Metropolis have evolved into a bigger uh, company, as have others, but maybe some have kind of fallen away. I have to give you a backup on this one. It's, um, as I need to, need to change sides now. As manager of, uh, of Came and Crooked, uh, I totally can uh, assure um, Hospitality is always, if we get in an offer for hospitality, you know, it will be 100% the audience the boys will, will, would like to play for. It's 100% assured it's a high quality event. And uh, so actually, I think it's a very important point kind of to promote, as you said, the music of the label of the artists also with shows. And I think it was very important to, to get to that point, to that level with hospital. hospital. And as uh, said, um, it's a no-brainer, as we say every time, in hospital offers coming in, and you can't of build up that network and structure all over the world uh, to uh, guarantee good shows for the artists on the label. It's great to hear. Well, another part of what happens, though, for us is that... Because um, part of the idea is that artists like Cam and Cricket, who are fucking incredible, then get really successful. And then, unfortunately, they get to a point where we have to think, I don't have enough, I can afford them anymore then that, that's when you actually maybe step back into, in, in, into a more traditional world of a promoter where you're having to make sensible decisions about cost and budget. None of the four of us can just simply pluck names from a tree and say, yeah, I'm gonna, pick, I'm gonna have those people play my show because the reality is, well, some of them aren't available, but actually a lot of them will turn down the fees that you offer and you have to have a ceiling and you have to, if you're a sensible promoter, you have to know when to say no. For us, that actually does actually also involve our own roster. It's not as simple as, you know, we don't ring up names from our website and they say yes. Frankly, a lot of the time they say no. And one of, the, one of the challenges I have in my position is talking to my events department and my marketing department saying, you have to understand, Danny Bird is allowed to say no. High Contrast is allowed to say no. Even Tony, and he's like my business partner, he can say no as well. We're fortunate we've got, we've got a big roster to choose from and that sometimes actually, you know, we. Our audience need a broader balance of artists anyway. Um, but make no mistake, it's not as easy as simply having a label and a roster and people say yes. Life <laughs> is not like that. To totally agree. And they're like, uh, probably people also have the, the image in their heads like you have the label and you call up the artist and they have to play or they will play. It's uh, just, uh, as you know, um, the normal cycle. So um, in this case, Josh just goes to our agent, the office coming in, and, but to, to, to point that out, uh, hospitals definitely the be are getting the best fees for the boys and, and we are all happy with, mm. because it's such a, you know, it was, uh, it was built up together and through hospital, and uh, in this case, uh, it's definitely uh, the way probably for some promoters to get 
came at Crooked for a fee or like within the package and uh, which mm. you couldn't afford in, uh, normally and to get that special uh, price and, and, and uh, package uh, with the hospitality. And yet, and yet we also have to make sure that we're careful that we, you know, we don't make promises that we can't deliver on. It's not, it's not down, I, <laughs> I would never say this is what I can get you Camo and Crooked for that much. It's not my job and it's the wrong position to take. And if I do that before I know it, we'll be falling out and Marcus and Riley won't talk to me again. You know, you have to you have to believe in the artist. You have to believe in the artist's uh, right and ability to be successful and to make money and to make their own decisions. I want, I might personally say that you know what? Sometimes uh, any artist might make some bad decisions. You know, artists sometimes go and take shows or fees that we as music fans, let alone promoters, might say, "Yeah, I wouldn't have done that." Yes, you got paid, but that is not a show that, as a fan of your music, I'd like to see you on. You know, and to and to point it out because I'm sure Ryan and Marcus uh, would say the same. Uh, for them, it's like a big, big thing that it's family. So they always they always uh, coming to the show, meeting the friends and and uh, the people who uh, who went with yeah. them over the last years. And it's always a kind of uh, family come together. It's like you know, and it's, it's it sounds like a cliche. You know, oh, it's, it's like family. Well, we're all old enough to have done this long enough that actually that, that is the way that we start it. Because most of us start our parties and our events by playing records ourselves, doing the door ourselves, putting the posters up with Blue Tech ourselves. You know, I mean, one of my favourite shows of recent years was when Hospitality played for Rampage at Trix uh, in Antwerp, maybe f five years ago, four years ago. And trust me, that was a fucking massive lineup. That was like, I, I put on everything. And it's like, what else have we got? You know? And it was, it was at a point at which NetSky was really, really coming through. And it was an exciting time to be in Belgium. But we had everyone come and play on that show. Uh, and that, that was another little moment. But uh, when Christian talks about family, it's true in that hopefully what, what happens is you go backstage and actually when Frevy and Graphics are waiting for Tony to finish or Hans is playing after Boris or something, people are actually... You might be showing each other photos of your kids or talking about the football or listening to music, and that's not forced. That's what should happen if you're doing your job right. Or showing the new VR porn. <laughs> I wouldn't know about that. <laughs> <laughs> I think it might happen sometimes. I th I think uh, it's but yeah, just to, to say also, it's, uh, um, I, I've to I totally can, can uh, 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 totally agree. Um, that's not the normal case with late nights. Like, uh, that family thing, uh, uh, and I've done a lot of label nights as a promoter, and you might end up having kind of a um, just put together lineup, um, not let's say cold feeling, not no vibe at all. So uh, that cliche uh, family wise, uh, I. Totally do, you know, do you know I think one of the worst things is is that a show, and this is not sp specific to a label night or anything else. But the thing I hate most is when an artist comes down five minutes before their set. And when they finish, they just walk, walk off and go home. I don't get that. I thought, I thought that people like all of us enjoy being at club shows. We enjoy being at festivals. We enjoy listening to music, watching DJs, talking to people and meeting people. And I always thought, I mean, I actually used to DJ. I used to be in London Electricity, funnily enough. And I, I did my fair share of DJing. And for me, a, a, a lot of the excitement was being backstage about an hour or two beforehand, just shitting my pants, hoping I'd actually get away with it and be all right, let alone you know, meeting Fabio for the first time at a show in Amsterdam and spending half an hour with him telling me how great our record label was. That's gold. All that shit is absolute gold. And I think Tony and I and Christian and Wilf and Hans, like, we, 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 that's kind of how we think. We kind of take it for granted, but then as you, sometimes you see younger artists coming through, you know, and they want to, you know, you need to meet their driver and their manager, and you're like, sorry, what? I, I thought we were just going to hang out and like listen to some music, have a beer, and then you can go on stage and I'll, I might listen to you DJ or I might not, you know? It's easy to kind of miss some of that simple shit, which we take for granted, because actually all you're doing is playing records or MP3s or whatever you're doing. You're playing music, you're meant to entertain people, you should be good value, and you should think about all the other aspects around that show, like how do you carry yourself backstage as a DJ? Are you a complete asshole? Because actually sometimes, yes, you are. And someone needs to pull you up on it and say, no, don't act like that. Nice manners. My mum always said, you've got to have nice manners. It's a big part, right, of actually, if Christian talks about a family vibe, you've got to have good manners, know how to treat people well, and actually know how to carry yourself socially. You should smash it out on stage in whatever style you're playing. 
but understand how to actually build relationships because that's part of the growth of hospitality, I believe, is having a good attitude, being patient, learning off other people around you and wanting to do better. And don't take the last sip of the last vodka bottle. No, fortunately, I don't drink vodka. <laughs> well, I think it's, it's, it's like you say, I think when, um, when you do a label party, a lot of that stuff is sort of done for you. And I think it's funny, the, the, the world has changed a lot as a promoter. I, I, like you say, I used to do the door. You used to have to do everything in Manchester just to try and make an event work. Now you've got someone who does artist liaison and does all this other stuff. And... You, you don't even know how that person's going to react. Whereas usually if someone's there's a label, everyone knows each other. So if there is a problem, someone's running late, there's an issue, it, it's just filled in. Whereas if you do, as a promoter, just stick a load of names together and someone's late or there is an incident, trying to get people to change set times or do other stuff is a nightmare. Um, and I think it is true that you say there's nothing better than... Um, booking that DJ or doing a label night where you see that person who plays from seven to eight in the evening and then three years later, five years later, they headline it and they come to you and go, oh, I remember when I first played here. Do you remember? And you're like, yeah, yeah, of course. And that's rewarding as a promoter. And you, it's hard, to, I suppose, to create that if you don't have the label parties because you probably would overlook that person. Unless they're a personal friend, you'd probably miss that. Um, and I think that's... I think there's a perception in the public that the more that there's label nights, there's, there's less community, when actually there's probably more community, they just don't see it. So they just see people go like, oh, well, I only like hospital, I don't like this label. And because the internet has given everyone a voice. So it's given us the ability to promote everywhere in the world. I don't go around sticking up fly posters anymore. I do miss that, but that's not, you know... That was, you know, that was my thing. When yeah. you, you know, when you, when you talk about the social aspect, the marketing aspect, these days that is tremendously hard. I mean, the kind of social channels that we as, uh, as company owners have built up, we've built up over many years, I'd be quite uh, fearful of trying to do that from the ground up right now. You know, most of us can sort of think in terms of we have 100, 200, 300,000 fa uh, Facebook followers, Instagram followers, those kind of things. You, you imagine if you want to start a, a, a label or an event now, that shit is really, really hard. And we're, we're working off 20 years in business. You know, we have a team of 21 people. You know, we have great people in our marketing department. We also work with brilliant international partners. Um, and that, that marketing aspect, I think, is probably harder than it's ever been. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to touch on that. It's a valid point. Um, you've got a very distinct thing in the industry now. You've got people who book for venues. So you go in and you go, I run a venue and I just book for the venue. The label parties are perfect because they've took the work out of it. If you were just trying to be a promoter going, I want to hire this club and I want to do this, trying to establish your own brand in that's really hard. But the way to get the footstep into the industry is with the label. But you're going to have to do a bit of both to grow up. You're going to have to, you know, it's that thing of saying you start at the bottom and you build up. You're going to have to. Because um, ultimately, what you want to do as a promoter is probably go, oh, I want to be the person who puts hospitality on in Amsterdam or Manchester or wherever it is. Because you go to those events. Because you have to be a special type of person to really want to promote. I have to be honest. You know, <laughs> there is far better things to be doing. Um, <laughs> And, and, and looking back, I mean, I put events on because I wanted to DJ more. That's why I started promoting, you know, and, and, yeah, and I, I wanted to put labels you. on that. I let, me, let me touch on that as well, because to me, promoting an event, still to this day, it's like an extension of DJing. I, I started putting on events to DJ more as well. And then I, I was mostly DJing myself at these events, like playing three, four hour sets. But then as things evolved and time moved on and the clubs got bigger and there were more people getting interested, we brought in more people from you know, outside, UK in, DJs In Hans' so case, the club got bigger. <laughs> Some I'm of glad them. I didn't carry his record back. So, Three, four hours. <laughs> so, but um, what, what I'm trying to say is that non doing a non-label night, because that's mainly what I do, part of what I love about it Actually, the biggest part of what I love about it is putting the lineup together because it's kind of like an extension of DJing where 
I would play this kind of sound in my yeah. set and then move on to that kind of sound and then build it up to that kind of sound and then take it back down. I can do that with, 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 with a non-label night. To some extent, that's possible with label night as well because I, uh, obviously I work with hospitality, I work with liquidity, but there's, there, there are limits to what you can do. But and to me, to me it's, it's, it's nice and it's easy to work with a, a, label, a label night once in a while because it, it, it allows me to kind of monetize on what I've built with the non-label night, like the network I have, the social media I have, the people I know, so that, that's, that's very welcome. But my preference still is the non-label night and just like, you know, get the brush and, and paint the picture however, however I like it. I think when you've built up a brand on your own, a label night now and then is a very good instrument to get in new people to your brand who wouldn't probably have come to just your show, but they're coming for hospital and they will come to your next show then because they liked it. So uh, it's, it's an instrument to attend new, new uh, customers, uh, to my mind, and uh, if it's used, uh, a label not used as an instrument and as special now and then. Um, it's an image transfer and, and, and helps to, to also uh, get your, get your uh, brand bigger. Um, but I, kind of as you said, being a promoter just booking shows to uh, a random club um, would have never been anything I would have started for or like I wanted to, to do. Yeah, I, th I think what you're saying as well, it, it complements. If you have a lineup that you've booked one month yourself and then the next month is a label party, those lineups complement each other and it, it makes a, a contrast. I think, um, I think where it, it probably becomes more detrimental um, is in, in the festival format. And I think we all do festivals on this stage and hopefully anyone in the, in the crowd ends up putting on their own festivals is if you've got drum and bass every day, then you can do a label party, a book party, and, and something different, or maybe even two label parties, as we said about Let It Roll, which is amazing. We, he's, he's able to represent so much. A lot of the festivals I work with, um, Bar Australia, you just go, bang, there's, there's one day that we're gonna allow drum and bass in that tent, and then you've got to pick. And then therefore you're like, oh, well, we don't want to because we want the best of everyone because we want the biggest crowd and I love drum and bass. That's what I'm about. So for me, I then think, well, what does the customer, someone might go down the road to a rival festival because we didn't have this DJ or this brand. And that's probably the only time where it's truly detrimental on that format is that people are forced to pick. But, um, but again, um, out of experience, it's always uh, how your relationship to, let's say, label or like uh, how your position is. I remember Urban Art Forms Festival uh, with a hospitality or hospital stage hosting with a lot of special guests because we had three days uh, drum bass stage and we had kind of to keep that broad spectrum and uh, it was no problem at all and we found a way to, to uh, make it happen. And actually, I think there was the only time I didn't have to discuss about set times at all, I remember. <laughs> <laughs> which, which, you know, is a curse. I mean, like at the moment, if you talk about events, regardless of the, the type of event, like billing and oh. set times, what a killer. One absolute killer. I can't, you know, it's hard to... Oh, it's only hard. doing alphabetical order since two years and won't change ever again. But, you know, but it's hard, it, 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 it's hard to remember back to when actually it was good enough to be booked. When someone wanted to, you know, I thought it was incredible that people wanted to actually give me money and put me on a plane and put me in a hotel and feed me and introduce me to people and let me play records for like a couple of hours. You know, now, a lot of the time for the four of us, you know, uh, so many of the struggles are about the ego and the marketing aspects that come with certain artists and acts. That's really utterly tedious, let me tell you. And that's, of course, within reason, that's the strength of a label night. I mean, we, you know, we have another label called Med School, which is our slightly, you know, maybe deeper, slightly more left field uh, version of hospital. And we were, we're fortunate that we've worked in the Roxy as a club for many years. Um, one of my favorite clubs in Europe. But not so long ago, maybe just a year ago, we actually did a Med School night here at Roxy. Now, that was one of the first ever label nights for that brand. And in doing it here, we, we were able to put an artist called Bop. Now, Bop lives in St. Petersburg. He makes a type of 174 BPM music that he calls microfunk. It's beautiful and bizarre. It's kind of electronic type music. And he played in that room to say 1,600 people. Now that, in a nutshell for me, is why what I do works. 
because I'm quite sure he never would have had that opportunity. He got it through the power of uh, the quality of the brand, great relationships between my office and the Roxy office, uh, faith. People, ha people have faith in you. You know, if you, if you have good manners, if you work hard, they will say, they will have faith in you. And when you say to them, right, you've given me a budget and here's a lineup, and they go, sorry, who are those two people? And you go, look, these are some of the youngest artists we've signed. They're going to cost you like almost nothing. I'm telling you, they're great. And probably in about two or three years, the idea is you will come back to me and want to book them for a headline show. It doesn't always happen, but sometimes it does. And if you have that opportunity and that and you're afforded that uh, chance, you can put on more, let's say, adventurous, uh, thought-provoking lineups and shows that might otherwise be enabled down to the, the pressure of ticket sales and marketing and everything else that does go with putting on an event. I, I was going to say that um, I, I, th I spend 60% of my life arguing about billing. And it's not even set times now. You know, it, it's just, it's about billing. But and they, it gets worse. Do you not always just like do alphabetical? You go, all right, mate, we'll do it alphabetical. We, well, you sort of do, but then big people will just go, I will not be behind these people. Why? Because my name <laughs> uh, starts went, with I, I, X. I, I, and you're like, well, that was your I, problem, I, wasn't I it? I had you cases know? with, if this <laughs> artist is standing in the same line as we do, we won't play. If, then, if these are, this guy's playing on the same day at the festival, yeah. This is probably why it's really handy for Andy C that his name starts with an A. That's, yeah, pretty, that's pretty useful. It's like, bruv, it's fine, I'll do it alphabetical. Yes, I win again. You know? Yeah. <laughs> I, know, I think it's, it's certainly that's one of the biggest issues you have there. I, I fully agree that labels help develop that and they deal with the set times as well. Because um, billing has just constantly become the biggest part of promoting now than actually you know, the event itself and, and the yet, promoter. And yet, do, you know, do, do you know what I think is really important? It's like how many times, and you know, you talk about the customer uh, and the fan, which is, which is fundamental and you're right to talk about them. But how many times, if you're a punter or you're going clubbing, how many times do you make your ticket purchase based on where a certain artist was billed? I mean, because if you do that, that's pretty messed up. I would have thought, personally, I still base my choices on the venue, because I like a really good space. I like the promoter, the brand, be that a label or a non-label or whatever that is, because that guarantees me a certain amount of quality, quality of security, beer, people, attitude. Like the, where those names appear I, I, on a lineup well, literally mean nothing well, to me. Yeah, Chris, but <clears throat> I think that's, that's what will happen in an ideal world. And I think in, in, in the real world, a lot of people base their am I going or not going on which headliner is, there, is playing at, the, at this Yeah, but then, but then also, I mean, like, you know... And, we'll and in, I, I agree, they're not going to pay a ticket depending on where he's built. But as a promoter, I'd like my... the guy that I need to pay the most money for and that I know will attract the most people, I yeah, want but, him to be to stand yeah, out on the but floor. So, but so what's the, what's the decision when, because you know you described quite accurately you know, how you would choose to book a lineup, and when the artist that you're reaching out to and you've made an offer to, and they're like, oh yeah, I'd love to play that show, I loved playing for you last year, how am I billed? Oh yeah, I can't do it. And you've got five other artists who've only just agreed to their billing based on what you told them, and you thought that your relationship with that artist was pretty solid, and they would actually willingly say, I will be billed third, and I'll take it. And then they say, no, I'm not going to play the show at all. And then you, as a promoter, so what, what are the decisions that you make there? You, which are you, don't, you don't book that artist. But, which is absolute madness. It, ma it is madness, but... Right? Um, That's but what I'm saying. The, that yeah. doesn't make any I, sense. I, I, yeah. I think hospital is in a, spe in a special position there, and it's one of the rare uh, examples where people mainly don't give a shit about the lineup. They know it will be a good event, and... Um, that's, Actually, uh, I think that goes I for, I mean, for a lot of the label events. Um, I, I, would, yeah. I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say. Um, let's take the example. We did a, well, did a Black Butter label night. Who it's all about, a Black Butter? It's, um, if a label has kind of one really big role model, and then, let's say, 
long distance, nothing, and then the small artists, it's kind of hard because everyone goes for the label night to get that name. At hospi hospitality, uh, for me as a promoter back in the days, it was always like you get the package, you get hospitality, and uh, attract people and customers uh, not only for because of one name on the, on, on the building. And um, that's, but that's not the, the usual say, case. It's what Chris is relating to is we were showing our age. I, I used to go to the same club every Friday night for a long time. And I didn't care who was on. I yeah, knew I was that's, going. That's then I would look ago, at though. the flyer and go, oh, wow, all these people are on. And that's when Sven Baff used to play five till six in the evening and he warmed up for everyone. So it was just people just played and it was that whole thing of I'm happy to be booked and to turn up and represent my music, you know. That was like the biggest reward. I, mean, I, think, I, I think we know that, you know, and this is probably very true of things like Rampage and Hospitality, you know, one of the best things that, 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 that we find is that we, sell, we basically, we sell a lot of tickets based on uh, a logo, a date and a venue, right? Yeah. That's a beautiful situation to be in when you know that you can sell uh, a third or half or, you know, we've done shows where we've, we, we've sold out shows with no lineup. And it's the same for Let It Roll. So many, so many, so many key brands that, that having put in the time and effort and love to what they're doing, can, know they can sell tickets without artist names. Now, how you explain that to booking agents and managers is a slightly delicate conversation. If you're really pushed very hard, you will tell them and you will put it on the line very plain. You know, and you know that I live in the real world. I'm merely saying that it may, it, it, it's, it's a madness to me that artists and their associated teams can willingly turn down shows based on something like billing, even though, you know, I would understand why maybe a set time might feel more important because, okay, fair enough, you know, you don't want to play early unless you've already been guaranteed two other shows that day on a different end of the motorway. But the most important thing is that you actually have your, your name of a certain size amongst a spread of artists who you respect and you feel confident doing a show with. But that's, well, that's I, a, I blame that's a, the a, managers a to start with because <laughs> no, they have no, to no, justify no. their money. Um, um. I, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a problem nowadays in general because, uh, and now I'm talking about Austria especially, uh, people are not going to shows to experience new music, to get known new artists. It's a kind of a consuming, a pure consuming. And then it's all about, uh, they don't want to think about, do I like this music? Is he a good DJ? Does he good perform whatsoever? He's a headliner, so he must be good anyway. And that's the point. Like uh, it's it's yeah, in we Austria, we have really kind of a, a headliner consuming orientated uh, uh, music music. Uh, but customers. people people don't think that they're going there to hear new artists, but they do hear new artists if the promoter is clever and is and is creative. You know, with the way they put their events on and they program it. And actually, you know, yeah, you, you're right. They're going they're going for a big night out. They're going for the hottest ticket in town. But if we do our jobs properly, we can feed them all sorts of exciting shit that they might not have thought I, about. I was going to say the benefit of that is the label night automatically does that. Certain agents and, and certain companies, if you want to take certain names and build your own lineup, will then go, you must take this person, this person. They're then not associated to the label that the headline act is on, but you still have to give them a squeeze. So you're almost... It's almost a parallel now to what the label night is, but at least with the label night, they're coming under yeah. some sort of absolutely, you know. Yeah, you know, you're, you're actually having ridiculous conversations with agents, you know, who will, you know, who will basically ring fence a, a, a headliner on the basis that yes, you can if you pay an outrageous amount of money, guarantee you everything else, the billing, the flights, um, and you take these three associated artists. The promoter says, no, I just came for that person. Well, you have to take them all as a package and not take them at all. So actually, you know, the label night says, that's fine. I just won't take any of them. I would have liked to have played them to have played the show. The artist said to me, that'd be great. I'd really enjoy to play the show. And then when I see him or her a year later, says, why didn't I play the show? Why well, just talk to your agent? I mean, uh, especially at festivals, I think that billing problem is also kind of an ego problem uh, of the agents. I had that many times, like, okay, now tell ex epsilon agent, uh, we uh, we will be build a buff him. Blah, blah, blah. It's always like um, how like they want to present themselves uh, uh, very strong uh, and and show their managements and artists they can push a name to the second line to the uh, head, as headliner position, and uh, that that, uh, that is all about how kind how strong uh, an agent uh, uh, is 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 looking like.
Yeah, it's insecurity in, in, in the whole thing. You know, a promoter is insecure that he can't get an artist unless he does a label night or he does certain things with an agent. You know, an agent is insecure because he has no valid contract with a manager. A manager doesn't have that good a contract with an artist and the label doesn't with an artist either. So we're all walking around going, oh, actually, I'm not that comfortable. <laughs> and that, that's the crux of where the industry is now. Where you go back to 10, 15 years ago, actually, I mean, drum and bass 20 years ago, there was two agents, three, who were very powerful uh, and basically dictated the whole sort of scene. And, and it was insane, you know, like... I mean, it's, <laughs> it's, it's, mu it's so much better now, but it's still, you know, it's still uh, bizarre. And there are, you know, you, we as people are having to manage a, a whole range of different relationships, some of which are very strong, some of which are a disaster. You know, there are... I think in, in whatever shade of this business any of us work in, you, you're always going to come up against some relationships that you just can't get past. You know, you're never going to be sending each other Christmas cards. You're not going to go out for dinner together. Occasionally, you will begrudgingly work together, you know. But uh, realistically, a, a strong brand, a, a strong event builds those bridges with the people that say yes, with the people that are willing, with the people that, that don't forget, actually turn up and then do a great show. You know, we're talking about the struggles of how you book someone, what they're happy with, do they like the font and how big their bloody name is. Never forget that they're meant to actually turn up and smash it out of the park, right? They're actually meant to be really good at what they do. There's the scary thing that uh, I was originally taught by someone, I don't care if they turn up. I just want to know they sold the tickets before we open the door. <laughs> and that was, that was the old rule. Whether they show up or not, by the time, you know, in, in, in the mid-90s, you know, whoever was playing the records played the records. A lot of clubs were very dark. And as long as people had a good time and the tickets were sold, that's you know, how, like, what happened. But, you know, also don't, <laughs> like, don't forget, there was also, there was a time, let's say 10, 12 years ago, in actual fact, a lot of DJs and MCs particularly would not show up week in, week out. Right, and you know, I mean, we're, we're laughing about it, but you would think, sorry, I, you just didn't show up because, uh, you know, and you get some lame ass excuse about a week later, and then you, re you know, because we all talk to each other, and you find out, oh yeah, they're, they're just, they're, they're just not, not showing up for their shows. This is ridiculous. Like, so you just blacklist someone, right? You just, why, why on earth would you offer to give them a marketing opportunity, let alone offer to pay them money if that's their attitude? And all of us as, prom uh, as promoters will probably know certain people that, you know what, I'm not going to go there again because you don't deserve it. And I'm not going to be that, that promoter again at a show saying, sorry, yeah, they didn't, they didn't make it. Yeah, I suppose really? the label, that, definitely the label really does help ensure that the acts that are booked turn up. But, but that, that got better anyway. Like uh, 10 years ago, uh, at, let's say Urban, Urban Art Forms with 80 drum and bass artists over the weekend, it was always at least 25% not showing up. Which is outrageous. Missed flights, oh, my mom is sick, whatsoever, and you could, could do anything. And, and especially, like, like especially in the last years, the industry changed a lot, to my mind. Um, of course, there's no, now more money into, into the drum bass scene, and it got bigger and but bigger. Also, but it's just it's about so, professionalism, you know? It doesn't matter yeah, how... Yeah, but it's also about the structures in the background. Like, some, some artists need uh, a management which is calling them up being the kind of mother role and, like, and taking care of. Like things. we had this, like we have, we have a young act called Fred Vian Graphics who were doing pretty well for themselves. We've been working with us for five years. The first time they got an offer to tour Australia, New Zealand, I got I got a phone call. I was having Sunday lunch with my kids, and Fred is like, "Yeah, I'm, I'm at the airport, um, and the plane left yesterday." <laughs> and I went, "Right." And he said, "What shall I do?" And I said, "Well, what do you mean, what should you do?" Why are you asking me? He's like, well, what should I do? Well, Fred, buy a ticket. He was like, what, don't, don't you sort that out for me? I was like, you must be out of your mind. I wouldn't, I wouldn't give you a bus fare, let alone a ticket. So he spent three and a half grand getting himself. He missed the first show, obviously, felt very embarrassed, but at least he made the rest of the tour. Now, generally now, Fred V doesn't miss flights, right? <laughs> But it's not, it's not hard love, it's just common sense, right? There's a lot of people, there's a lot of people in his office, let alone people across Australia and New Zealand, working hard to sell tickets. And it, it, it still amazes me that artists in our world 
can kind of have that attitude that it's all right just to miss a few every now and then. It's never all right to miss a show unless you know unless you are absolutely unless you've got a doctor's note. Turn up. I, th I think uh, the one thing that we say is the professionalism of everything um, has increased it, and I think uh, as a as a promoter. I mean, we, we used to joke in the 90s, you'd, uh, by traveling around the whole of the UK, going to raves, you'd go, oh, that DJ's playing 10 gigs that night. Well, he won't go there, and he won't go there, and he won't go there, so we'll go here, because he'll be there. Yeah. And he would be. And you'd think, what happens to all those people in them other places? What did they see? What, you know, who did they think it was in front of them? Yeah. You know, um, and I think that's the benefit. I think that's one of the real big pluses of the internet as well, is someone can't, be advertising something that isn't happening as well because there was as many promoters that were unscrupulous going here's such and such playing here yeah and you get, like, you get you called know. out straight away yeah live on instagram yeah. <laughs> yeah 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 so i think you know in in that regard having that security as well from labels because people represent that sort of helps because there is still promoters out there and there's certainly clubs out there who will say certain people are going to turn up at certain places and, and and being in the industry i know they won't be doing you know um that's not particularly so much drum and bass but in other genres and certainly with a lot of us acts this is the case quite often um so in that regard having a, a relationship between an agent who's got acts and a label if you also work with the label in programming the show then that actually gives a promoter more security I, th I think something else that we haven't actually mentioned is, is the idea of actually being good, like as a DJ and a performer, and actually thinking deeply about what you're going to do. There's a danger that in this world of 60 minute sets or sometimes 45 minutes when someone's late and everything gets backed up, that you can just, especially now, you turn up with your two USB sticks and you play all the same tunes that everyone else just played in the last five hours. Now, just because they might be current tunes and you'll get a reaction from those poor, tired ravers who just need a little bit of energy, for God's sake, think about what you're doing. I'm not, I'm not suggesting that you, know, that you do a little magic show or spin some plates while you're playing records. Think about the selection. We take it for granted that technically you should be brilliant because it's easy to be technically brilliant these days because it's all quartz locked and digital. But the selection and the choice of tunes and how you're actually trying to play to a crowd are you just simply running through a Beatport playlist or are you at a Rampage show or a Metropolis show looking up, looking at a crowd? Have you been there? It's another reason to turn up early. Did you hear what the DJ before you played or are you going to play the last 15 records in a different order that he just played and look like a mug? So think about being good and think about practicing and think about digging out for old classics. Like we've, we've, we've got a young artist called Krakota who's just releasing his brand new album. And it's not easy to get him bookings because he's still a relatively unknown artist. I shit you not, he's one of the best DJs I have seen in 10 years. He is, his, his knowledge of drum and bass music and his selection and his skill and the energy and the ability to read a crowd is exactly what excites me as a, as a record label guy and just as a fan of drum and bass. And there aren't enough DJs, I feel, like that, making that degree of effort I agree. I, th I think a good record label and family, people work on it and go, all right, I'm playing this time, so I'm going to do this and try and be, break a bit out of the box. A lot of people, uh, label nights and non-label nights, just turn up and just play to a formula, and then you just go, where were you? you know, like, like, do you know what? Like in the really classic good old days of when we were doing Heaven, which is like 10 years ago, what I really loved about those shows was basically... High Contrast, Danny Bird, Scientific, London Electricity, those four in particular would, before every time we did Heaven, they would make two or three or four specials. They'd do their own remixes of classic tunes or emerging dance music tracks of the time, simply to outdo each other, right? That shit doesn't happen enough anymore. Yeah. As a result, you'd stand there in the crowd and you'd be like, I'll be, I remember waiting for Lincoln to go on stage and he started and the first thing he played was something called Gold Digger, and it was his remix. And no one had heard it before, and the place went utterly mental. And I remember when he did it with the Adele remix, and that, that, those are little moments in a club as a promoter, let alone in an artist's career, that set you apart. And I'm, you know, I'm talking about making an effort and working hard at what you do, but when you, when you actually 
physically go and make music specifically for one show, that's when you're killing it. And like, I don't see people like really investing. Would you, would you agree that, that your artists tend to play more of their own music at a hospitality show than at an, at just a random show? Um, I think it probably depends. It probably depends on the artist. Like, say, if you've got an artist who is in, say, they're in cycle, their album is just coming out or it's been out for a month or they're working up towards it, then I would understand why they're going to want to be out there playing a lot of tracks from the album because they're excited to play them. They want to see how they drop, how they react, and that's kind of part of where their head is at at that particular point. Like I said, a really a, a great artist of any age thinks about thinks about the show, thinks about the selection. What time are they playing? Who else is on the bill? Are they playing at Tricks or are, are, are they playing at the Albert Hall in Manchester? What do they know about that crowd? You know, and a really good producer DJ stitches that together intuitively based on they know they have certain classics. Like if you see logistics, he'll probably play together at some point in the set because people will kill him if he doesn't. But at the same time, you know, he will dig out old classics from Virus and he'll you know, he'll, he'll dig out kind of remixes from friends. Um, and I think, I think one thing that I've seen is that there is a danger if, an art, if a producer DJ exclusively and only plays their own tracks, and actually most of them are unreleased, because people are like, okay, cool. They kind of sound fairly similar. I haven't heard these before. So I'm, I'm just sort of waiting for something that I might remember. You know, the, the, the great DJ, you know, and this goes back 30, 40 years, knows how to play to a crowd, knows how to entertain and tell a story through a selection of tunes that could all be at the same tempo, but how to really make that work. Well, I think that's a good definition. The good DJ nowadays uh, needs at least some producer skills to do these special versions, um, mixes whatsoever, because nowadays uh, everything is copy-paste within two minutes. Shazam, oh, that track, by it can play it in half an hour. Uh, back in the days when the doublet business was on, <laughs> you were you were in, in the lucky circle but playing then, numbers but, like for for half but a I, year. I, I, I don't, you know, I, I, honestly, I don't think it is down to being a producer. I think it's down to actually just the old-fashioned idea of being a great DJ, and that and that, if if we all recognise that now the technical skill is less of an issue, like when me and Wilf were first DJing, actually, I mean, I found it really hard playing, I still find it hard playing drum and bass, because technically, actually, it's quite difficult trying to make records on turntables play at the same tempo. If you put that to one side now, because it's all, it's all locked anyway, then the, the selection and the timing and, how, and knowing actually when to drop those 16 bars and when to bring in that big breakdown and all that kind of stuff. This is, this is actually, this is the history of dance music we're talking about. It's not exclusive yeah. to drum and bass. It's about, it's about being a brilliant performer. A selector. I, I was taught by someone that um, you only know if you're good when you've played in a club on one deck. And I've had to do that <laughs> twice. Yeah. yeah. Because then you, you know that that tune's got to finish, you've got to turn it out, it's got to go quiet, or the crowd have got to make noise, and you better play the next record. And if you watch some of the selectors and the old Rodi um, reggae selectors and people like David Rodigan, who is as current now as he's ever been, he just plays a tune. And he stops that tune, then he plays the next tune. Yeah, and, and that, people go mental. That's the power of selection. Yeah. I mean, it's, you know, he's also learned how to be a great performer. He's drawing on all of that Jamaican sound system culture. But, like, you know, in, really in the old days, I've done shows like that because you'd be playing on belt drive decks and one of them just will break. So you have one record deck to play on. And if, I mean, you know, I've done shows where you had to try and MC through a pair of headphones because there isn't a microphone. And you do whatever you can, right, to make to it work. Yeah. Like Andy said earlier, you never walk away from a set, right? You know, I've actually had these, I've had DJs that stand back from some decks and just cross their arms and go, well, I can't do it. I'm like, sorry, what? Yeah, it's never what, did you find it technically a little bit challenging? because you just had to press play and then you couldn't get beyond that, right? You don't walk away from a set, you don't walk away from a crowd. And that comes down to confidence and practice and, and commitment. And if you, yeah, if you've got to play on one deck, do it on one deck. You could get your mate to stand there quickly, whip off the dub plates, throw them back on, or whatever it takes. It's not, you know, it's not all about beat matching, it's about selection and entertaining, you know? All right, on that note, <laughs> Have we decided a let's label night's better? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah, more label nights. Let's, let, let, let's have let, more label nights. Leave that up to the people uh, out here. Um, maybe, maybe there's anyone, anyone out there that has a question has been waiting to ask <coughs> for the past 60 minutes. 
Yes. Yes. Get Suki, one, get Suki oh, to ask a question. <laughs> no, uh, and he's I, paying everyone, so just be very careful. <laughs> I just want to get back to the um, billing issue uh, just uh, quickly. <laughs> I want to ask you uh, if you ever saw or heard any proof uh, that the billing really affects the career of the artist. Because this is something what we start uh, to ask to the agents, and they have no answer. I, I think uh, the is it just the ego, or does it really affect the career of the artist? The I, I think Let It Roll is a good example. Uh, if I, if you bill an artist at Let It Roll, let's say very high, with very big way, um, other promoters, unexperienced younger promoters, will kind of build that picture of this artist in their heads as bigger than the one beyond. Um, that's what, like, what I think is the effect sometimes, think, which it shouldn't be. But um, I think I think he's right. But I also think that agents do it to show some balls. No, 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 no I, I think, I we, think we're they missing do it. The I point. didn't do it because they think, you know, it might work. So but why no. why not go for it? I've If it doesn't work, then you know we'll still be on top. So that can't not can't that's hurt. But, so but that, that's also the game between uh, uh, agents and, and, and promoter. Like, if you're an experienced promoter and have a name, it, like, if I tell Suki, uh, put whatever, uh, Wilf as a headline on Lady Roll, he will ask me if, I'm, if I lost my mind. mind. Yeah. But he, because he knows exactly, like, oh, uh, no, cheap, and yeah. he, he knows about the, the, the artist profile, uh, the fees, or like, if I tell him, okay, I need 10 grand for Wilf to play, otherwise we won't show up. Private chat, of course. You will know it's nonsense, but um, and that's probably what what's uh, really a shame that a lot of big agents, if they if they recognize uh, they're dealing with let's say a young festival promoter, a new unexperienced one, they're always going for as much money as possible, as much or like not all agents of course, but uh, um, a lot of uh, I made a lot of bad experience or like. A, Uh, there are a lot of bad, uh, examples out there. Is it? I, th I think what we we also probably missed here is is that in drum and bass and at something like Lay Roll where it's it's predominantly drum and bass music, the agents and how people work, everyone knows everyone. But I, if I put myself in an agent's shoes, I want this name to be there because it's the billing that I want at Coachella or somewhere else where I'm going to be charging daft money and it might not be a drum and bass stage. So I'm not, I don't want to sit here and completely hate on agents. I know why they do what they're doing and I know why managers are trying to do it because the big paydays usually are from events and festivals that aren't specific to the genre that your artist represents. It's just your artist is hot of that genre at that time. Um, I think also basically it's a tactic. It's a tactic from an agent or a manager. Naturally, it's like the, you know, if he, if he or she accepts lower billing on a couple of occasions, then the artist's career will nosedive. If that's the case, there's something wrong with the artist, in, in my humble opinion. Um, and also, uh, a thoughtful, creative artist will willingly and happily accept a slightly lower billing on one show on the basis that they'll probably get a slightly higher billing somewhere else. And that actually, do you know what? If billing is a real problem for them, then they need to step out of themselves and go do something different, go do their own headline tour on their own. You know, if an artist is killed off by poor billing, then the artist has something wrong going on in their career already. So yeah. um, I've got I've got a, a little an anecdote to go with this. There's an artist I booked, and there were a bunch of artists, and they needed their logos on the flyer, on the artwork. And then one of the agents, one agent of one of the artists, asked me if his art his artist logo could be slightly bigger <laughs> on the flyer. And I said, so how, how much bigger do you want it? And he said, just big enough so it looks like I'm doing my job. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard that one as well. We've had that before. Brilliant. I thought it was very honest of him. Yeah. <laughs> Anyone else? Any more questions? There was someone in the back over there. Yeah, there's the mic. Uh, Chris, uh, I really like the concept of hospitality barbecue or similar daytime action. <laughs> How is it going or will you expand this concept or...? Uh, thank you. Um, the the barbecue idea was, I guess, you know, for us, you know, we do we do shows internationally, but London is always, you know, London is home. London is our focus. We, you know, there's there's only so many venues in the city of London, sadly, that can, you know, that you can work in and take a certain amount of people. We were looking to try and do something different. Um, we've always part of the ethos of the label is trying to do. Th 
things slightly differently. You know, that's why we never had a resi residency at Fabric, because that's what everyone else did. Um, and we did get offered one. Um, but in looking for th something else to do, there was this venue, the, 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 a venue called Studio 338, which is um, just by the tunnel by the Millennium Dome, right in the centre of London. We had the opportunity to do a daytime show there. Uh, in doing that, we then thought, well, if it's going to be daytime, you're going to have to serve food. And we kind of a and r the, the lineup of the food and the beer as much as we a and r the lineup of the artists. And that was fun and also showed that actually we do care because there's nothing worse than going to a, an outdoor show and having really shit beer and a horrible hot dog, right? And getting charged 25 pounds for it. So we did that uh, two, no, three years ago for the first time. And I mean, it, 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 it sold out so quickly without any artists. The most important part was that it was daytime and we were selling craft beer, uh, jerk chicken and cheesesteak. That's how we sold out the show. So we did it again the following year um, and it's, you know, it's just, it, it, it's been a, a, a thoroughly satisfying addition uh, to the event schedule that we run. And so we now find ourselves for the first time doing a, an outdoor show in the park, in Finsbury Park, which is at the end of September. Please come, you can buy tickets. Um, <laughs> but I guess that's another, that's like another extension of what we're trying to do. What we're all trying to do as promoters, you know, you look at, you look at the, the madness and the scale of something like Rampage, which was... <laughs> A lot smaller when I first went, and I went in March. There's like 16,000 people in a fucking sports stadium. You know, we're now the same as like, same as Christian, same as Wilf. You know, we're, we're, I think we're all we're all ambitious. You know, we're trying to make good choices, but we're all trying to grow what we're doing. Same as Let It Roll. So now doing this outdoor show, and it's a proper knee trembler doing that. We've never done it, anything like that. Uh, it's like 10 and a half thousand tickets in a big London park. Uh, it's all day, and it will finish at 11 o'clock at night. Um, we're obviously hopeful. I mean, we've sold three quarters of the tickets, so hopefully it should be a good night out, a good day out rather. Um, and hopefully that's part of us continuing to basically build on everything that the four of us have been trying to, de uh, to describe, you know. But you do it, you do it with hopefully the same amount of um, integrity and faith in yourself and your brand and your music. You don't, just because we're doing an outdoor show, we haven't changed the lineup. We haven't tried to do what other people do. It's called hospitality in the park because it's literally hospitality and it's in a park, right? Uh, I think, Chris, an interesting point is with the barbecues, with those sort of things, as a, as a normal promoter, that isn't something that I would look at. But if a label said to me, let's do this, I'd be like, right, okay. And so that's... That the label, because it has that following and that ability to extend out, as, as normal as I'm perceived as a club promoter or a festival promoter, I have to f sort of be seen to fit in certain ways, and I'm probably too looking at things a certain way, whereas a label can go, yeah, you know what, we're going to do this, and we're going to have a tea party or a barbecue or whatever it is, and actually they can do it. Whereas if, if Metropolis tried to do that, I think a lot of people would be like, well, that's weird. What, mm. You're going to try and put these DJs on at one o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, but I think it's know. also, and it's also probably part of what all of us do as, as music lovers is, you know, we, you know, we take it for granted that we live and breathe in the world of drum and bass and that's where, where, where we have all of our activities going on. But, you know, we all probably like hip hop or grime or reggae and dancehall. And so we instinctively look at other things. We look at other people's t-shirt designs. We look at other people's summer parties. We look at their album launches. This is what we should do. And we're con hopefully we, we're continually looking around us and thinking, that's a good idea. And I don't think anyone's done that in drum and bass. Or I, I like the way that that lineup has been programmed or the way that, that that stage has been designed. I haven't seen a light show like that. I haven't seen uh, a venue dressed like this before or I haven't tried to do something in an airfield, all these kind of things. That's meant, it's meant to be a creative process. We're all meant to be pushing ourselves. If you're just going through the motions, there's no point because there's like another 100 people willing to go and fill the same club with the same DJs in a different order. Uh, you know, if you work in the creative arts, you should be a creative person yeah. and willing to take take a few risks. I mean, you don't want to lose your shirt, but you want to try some stuff out. Otherwise, you're going to go around in circles and probably find yourself a little bit bored. Yeah, thank you. Any, anyone else? More questions? Nope. Then that's it for us. Chris, Christian, Will. Thank you. Thank you very much.